Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Everything that we create in terms of content or in terms of our products, it needs to be authoritative, it needs to be helpful, and it needs to be interesting. Hey, my name is Felix. I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each week, we learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs like you. In this episode, you'll learn how to create a team of writers and how much it'll cost, how to hire customer service representatives that will increase your revenue, and how having a picture of you and your team on your website can increase your sales. Today, I'm joined by Sebastian Breyers from Aura Organic. Aura Organic makes plant-based, sustainably sourced, cruelty-free supplements formulated by a nutrition console and flavor by an in-house chef. Now, starting in 2014 and based out of San Diego, California. Welcome, Sebastian. Hi. So tell us a little bit more about some of the, the most popular products that you guys sell. Yeah, um, so one of the top products we have uh, out at the moment uh, is our probiotic capsules. Um, we also do that in a powder form as well. Uh, that's been really, really big for us, especially on subscription on our website. Uh, it's a 16 billion CFU probiotic. It has no fillers. It's all vegan and uh, organic, made with organic materials. Um, so yeah, that's probably mm-hmm. that's probably our top one out there. We also have like a really great uh, protein powder. Uh, so all of our products are non-GMO, gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, uh, vegan, and organic, and made from food. So uh, that one is, yes. I think it's 20 plus uh, superfood greens and uh, from the land and from the sea. And it's a, it's a really good one too. Definitely one of our top sellers. Very cool. Yeah, you have a, a lots of different products uh, on the site. So I know that I was looking through the site. I noticed that there's a, a team right behind this this uh, company. Can you tell us a little bit more about your your day to day responsibilities uh, over at Aura Organic? Yeah, for sure. So um, Aura sort of started out with the four co founders. Uh, so I'm the chief technology officer and head of growth. Uh, we have Will, who's our CEO. Uh, Erica, uh, my sister, actually, uh, who's our chief marketing officer. And Ron, who, another friend of uh, ours, who's our chief operating officer and head of sales. Uh, so my job is has sort of been from the start to be a bit of a growth hacker. Um, I've got a background in tech, uh, in building banking software. So I started out my own uh, web design firm about three years ago uh, and then sort of transitioned into Aura. And uh, yeah, I've just been sort of growth hacking it uh, since the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, where did this idea behind the, the business and the products come from? So it originally came from, uh, so Will was, our CEO, was a vegan for, a strict vegan for three years, and he found himself becoming uh, deficient in vitamin B12, and he just couldn't find like an organic, plant-based, uh, food-based version uh, of B12. Everything was made from synthetics or from uh, meat sources. And uh, yeah, he decided, well, I'm going to go out and do this myself. I'm going to go out and create one. Uh, So he went out and tried to make that happen. Um, That proved to be really, really difficult, um, mainly because there aren't really any great bioavailable sources of vitamin B12 um, that are vegan, I should say. And yeah, so he decided, well, I'm going to go out and going to make some some really good organic uh, vegan products because It's happening in every other industry. It's happening in like laundry detergent. It's happening in food. It's happening in clothes. Everything's going organic. And it just hadn't really happened yet in supplements. Mm -hmm. And how did you guys come together as a team? Where did the, where did the the business behind this uh, form? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a funny story, actually. So Will moved to Australia for about eight months uh, in I think early 2014, late 2013, 2014, um, which is where he met Erica, my sister, um, and they got acquainted and actually in two weeks they're getting married, uh, which is quite cool. And um, yeah, so they sort of got together there and uh, Erica has a background in fashion and design. So Will had this idea for this company and he was like, hey, Erica, do you want to help me out with the design and branding for it? And she said, yes, sure. Um, and then they needed a website. 
So they contacted me and said, hey, do you want to come on board and build our website? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, and I should also mention prior to that, uh, Will had recruited Ron straight out of, uh, he had been working at Salesforce and then he'd gone off to culinary school to become a chef. Um, and then not long after he'd finished that and had been working as a chef for a while, uh, Will recruited him to come and do all the flavorings for the products. So the team sort of just sort of, I guess, mashed together from right. all over the world. Uh, and yeah, then eventually uh, Erica moved over to San Diego. I moved up here. Um, and yeah. And in here you move, is it Vancouver where you're, you're, you're based on Vancouver? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So obviously you, you joined the team as uh, at least you, you grew into this role of, it sounds like very marketing focus, uh, becoming a growth hacker. I think mm. a lot of folks out there listening would love to add more growth and, and grow th their business and grow their traffic and sales. What are you doing a, on a day-to-day -day basis? It's just in general to, to contribute to, to the growth of, of the business. Yeah, I mean, it it's pretty wide ranging. Um, that's kind of what I love about growth uh, is that you really need to incorporate all aspects of the business. It's not just about like really amazing Facebook ads or like uh, going and getting like a bunch of like uh, followers through email marketing campaigns or something like that. It is a combination of like designing the products really well. So um, part of what I do is I help research what products we're going to do next. Um, and we use a lot of data that we get from our customers, uh, from uh, big web, like big shopping websites like Amazon and from Google Shopping. Um, and we figure out, you know, what product will perform well next. Uh, and then another part of my job, I guess, is to help with the product launch. So that, that does include Facebook ads. That includes uh, picking what content we generate around each product as we launch it. Uh, and then what channels we market it through. And then what sales channels we pick. And do you make a lot of your decisions around data? Like what are you, what are you looking at to, to determine which channels to be in or what kind of content to create? Yeah, we're really looking a lot at like Google search trends. Um, because when, when you're just starting out, I mean, the biggest, like fastest way to get traffic to your site uh, without spending too much money is to just generate really good content for long tail keywords. So, I mean, that's what we did right right from the start is we just thought, okay, we have these three products, uh, the probiotics, the protein powder, and an omega-3. We thought, what questions are people asking about these products that we can answer really well because we have this nutrition council at our disposal. We have this, these are we have PhDs who have great information, but no one's really heard from them. Uh, how can we make that information approachable and easy and also SEO friendly? And we did that. And uh, I mean, the response was kind of, we got a bit lucky, I, I will say, with uh, with the probiotics one. Um, I mean, if you Google how to take probiotics or when to take probiotics now, uh, we I think we're on either the first hit or that little meta box that shows up on Google. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I think being able to like research what questions your customers are asking and then going and answering that in a really clear uh, meaningful and helpful way uh, is just a great, great tactic to get uh, get up those search rankings. And yeah, if those questions are already out there, then it can also drive product decisions. So it might be like, oh, I'm looking for a pre-workout for women. Why aren't there any ones that aren't, uh, you know, all about getting jacked or anything like that? Like, why aren't there ones that are just more about providing me with a clean energy boost? Mm -hmm. um, so that was that kind of question was what motivated us releasing a, a pre-workout that while not necessarily targeted directly at women, um, it's more gender neutral, just as for everybody. Right. Got it. So it goes beyond, I think one lot of people think about marketing, they think, okay, the product exists already. Let me see how I can get this in front of the, the right people, the, the, the customers, but growth hacking or the kind of stuff that you're doing is more of a, a cycle. You, 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 do, you are promoting a product that already exists, but then you are going back with feedback and re essentially redesign the product or redesign the packaging or messaging from the beginning so that it has, it has a much better chance of success. And it's, it just goes beyond just, you know, running paid ads, like you're describing, there's a lot of data involved. Are there specific tools that you're using to help you understand, to, to help you do this kind of research? Yeah, there are. I mean, one of the one of the great tools um, that we've used for a while now is uh, Keyword Finder from Mangools. I think that's how you pronounce it. 
Um, it's just a, it has a really good tool for that accesses the Google search API and helps you understand what questions are out there around your product. And then you go and compare that with just Google's uh, trend analysis tool. Um, and then you can also mine big databases like Amazon uh, using tools like Jungle Scout uh, to sort of figure out where there are niches as well. So those are just a, a few uh, few ones that I really like using. Mm -hmm. So you now identify what kind of questions people are asking, what, what are people confused about, and you recognize that this is an opportunity for us to come in and educate the market. And by educating the market, they're going to discover the, the, the site, the, the brand, the products. So once you are identify what kind of keywords you want to target, what is the, what is the process for creating the content? Uh, so we have a team of writers who we send these questions out to, um, and we have different writers for different topics. So what we generally do is we send it out, we get a draft back from them. Uh, Erica, uh, the chief marketing officer, will review it. And then once we're, once they're sort of happy with the general content and that it's the readability of it um, and the authority of it, then... Yeah, it comes back to me mm -hmm. and I'll optimize it for those keywords and those questions and review it with Erica again and we'll just go and put it out into the into the zeitgeist. Uh, and then depending on depending on the content, uh, we'll we'll boost it, see how it performs on a platform like Facebook. And then if it performs really well, then we'll advertise it as well. Um, because if we're driving traffic from Facebook, Google will rank it higher as well. Got it. So I like that you are are utilizing uh, outsourced writers because I think a lot of times people don't create any content at all because they don't like writing or it's just not what they want to focus their their mm. their energy on, right? Because they want to focus on what th their core values. So you guys have a team of writers that you work with. W where are they coming from? How do you find writers to to contribute content? Honestly, all over the place. Uh, we've got writers in Europe, in Germany, uh, in England, in the states, in Canada. Uh, a lot of them have found us through Instagram um, or through Facebook. Uh, but yeah, early on, we just sort of reached out to ones that we thought were cool or uh, also through some of Will and Ron's friend networks um, initially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are these writers that you're looking for either early on or, or these days, are they already writing in the nutrition niche and nutrition category, or do you look for writers outside the, the category? What's your kind of filter? I mean, it, it really depends on the, on the content. If it's, if it's something that needs to be very authoritative, like it needs to be very uh, clear and have lots of references and uh, be like just very, very well researched. Then we'll look to someone who has a nutrition background. Um, a lot of our writers have formal qualifications, like uh, whether they're a naturopath or a PhD or a doctor of some kind. Um, and then, yeah, we, we also verify all those references and any claims that may be made in those articles too. There are some more fun um, pieces where we just use I, I, writers who are a bit more, uh, I don't know, they're just a, a bit more friendly, a bit more approachable. Um, although we try and do that with all of our content. Yeah, it really it really depends on how sensitive the nature of that content is. Yeah, and when you are looking for a more authoritative, well-researched piece, would that typically cost more? Is there a bigger budget behind those pieces? Uh, yeah, they, generally it, it is a bit more expensive for sure. Um, but I mean, it's still not, I, I don't think it's uh, unreasonable considering right. how much, much traffic you can drive. Um, and then... You think about once you once you drive that traffic to your site, you think about the number of touch points you create with that person once they read that content um, and the opportunities once they're in the funnel to go and resell and upsell and remarket uh, and do all that. It just ends up being worth it. Like you only need two or three people to purchase. Um, and then, you know, the lifetime value of that customer far mm -hmm. exceeds what you pay for the article. So you're talking about like a budget of maybe $100 or less typically for one of these pieces of content? Yeah, I mean, it can vary all the way up to, I guess, uh, like $250. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've definitely paid for some for some more expensive ones too uh, when it's been, you know, particularly important to have an extremely qualified person. Uh, but yeah, I, I think if you, can, if you can hit between 50 and 100, you're in a good place. 
Got it. Now, what, what kind of guidelines do you provide the, these writers? I'm assuming you have some kind of topic that you want them to write about, but what else do you do you give them to to give them to, to get started? Uh, so they'll also get the list of questions and related questions mm-hmm. and keywords um, that come from that come from us that we do that we find uh, in our research, and we'll prioritize uh, those for them. So we'll be like, okay, this is a top tier uh, keyword that you need to get into your into your article. Um, one of the things that we've been experimenting with as well is TLDRs, so just too long didn't mm-hmm. reads, and having them either at the start or the end of the article and getting the writer to write really good summaries um, as well. Because if you aren't, if you basically put the TLDR in question form, then that also ranks really nicely on Google as well because it creates concise answers to the questions uh, that people have. Got it. I think one of the concerns too with uh, hiring a, a, even one writer or especially a team of writers is keeping that that tone, that voice the same or similar at least. How do you how do you accomplish that? How do you accomplish that when you have a team of writers that are all contributing content? Yeah, so uh, Eric has actually uh, prepared pretty comprehensive guidelines uh, on the kind of writing uh, that we like on the website. Um, and up until recently, uh, a lot of the content was passing all, always through her, um, but now we've hired a content manager to go through that, um, I guess because we're at that stage that we can do that now, um, who, go, who goes through that and makes sure that every piece that comes through meets those meets the requirements of uh, that guy, the guidelines that she creates. Yeah, and any any idea what what's in that guideline? How how do you how would someone create a, a guideline that's comprehensive enough so that they can have the writers create the content that sounds like the voice of the company? Yeah, um, I guess it comes down to three core principles uh, that we sort of use internally. Um, so everything that we create in terms of content or in terms of our products, it needs to be authoritative, it needs to be helpful, and it needs to be interesting. So the way that uh, Erica has done it uh, is to pull out, uh, I guess, some of our best pieces, pull, out, pull paragraphs out of our best pieces, and then analyze them and explain to writers how they meet mm-hmm. each of these criteria. So you give them examples, basically, of what, what you're looking for exactly. Yeah. Got it. Now, once the content is written, you, you mentioned that sometimes you will boost a, 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 a is it like a Facebook post or something that you're boosting? Yeah, Facebook post. And how do you determine which ones you decide to boost versus ones that you you don't? Uh, generally, it's just a sort of benchmark of engagement. So we look for anything that's between what, I mean, it varies. Sometimes we'll, we'll pick posts that we just really like uh, and we'll boost them because we think, oh, this is actually a great question mm-hmm. and this just needs to get out to, to more people. But generally, anything that's getting engagement through our normal Facebook page of above 2%, uh, we will boost that. Got it. So you look for things that typically are already working and then since they're already working, you realize that if you kind of apply more leverage to it, then it'll work even better. Now you you get the the kind of uh, the final uh, draft, then you are going to optimize the optimize it for, for SEO purposes. Any tips here for anyone out there that maybe doesn't know much about SEO or just uh, has very little experience with SEO? Like how can they take an article that they've written or someone's provided with them and try to optimize it for, for search traffic? Yeah, um, I think the number one tip is it's not it's not keyword stuffing. Um, don't just go and try and put all of the keywords and all of the key phrases and questions into the article. Find different ways to word them uh, because Google Google's natural language processing techniques or algorithm, whatever they're doing, they look for, I guess, well-written pieces. Um, and that means like paraphrasing, like a question like how to take probiotics might uh, turn into when it, when is the best time to take probiotics in the morning or at night. Uh, so that would be a good example of something that Google will recognize as applying to the question when to take probiotics. So it's really not repeating yourself too much mm-hmm. and finding different ways to say similar things or answer the same question. Right. What you, were you guys creating the same amount of content early on as you are today? Like how, how much as a, uh, how much content are you producing uh, these days? Oh, we probably produce three to four pieces a week um, at the moment. 
I think that's a lot more than we started out with when we were sort of doing one piece per week. Uh, it has been a bit of a slow start to the year, uh, but we, yeah, we generally stick around that sort of three to four pieces mark. I don't think we'll increase that too much uh, going forward either, because we do want to make sure that these are really top quality pieces that are getting out there and that they're not, we're not just trying to, yeah, I guess spray it everywhere. Right. I think I think one of the um, the concerns that entrepreneurs have with the, the approach of SEO, uh, one of the big benefits though is that it's typically much cheaper than than paid search traffic. But one of their concerns is this loss of instant gratification. Or you can't just turn on a Facebook campaign, put money towards it, and all of a sudden get a lot yeah. of traffic. Uh, in general, in these days, like how long does it take for you guys to you know put a piece of content out there and then and then to rank it? Like what what are some uh, ballpark uh, waiting times or waiting periods? I guess for for producing content and then actually seeing its results in search traffic. I mean, it varies pretty pretty widely. Uh, I mean, we have a piece on uh, vegan vitamin D or what is vitamin D, for example, that came out two weeks ago, and it's already on the. I think it's on the second page of Google right now for what is vitamin D. Um, so that's moving up the rankings quite quickly. But then we have other pieces that have taken, you know, all of six months to start ranking. Uh, like we have a piece on, uh, I think it's ashwagandha benefits for women that just all of a sudden picked up uh, late last year, even though it's been a piece on our website for six months. Um, so, I mean, I guess my sort of advice here is it helps to be doing both strategies, the long-term strategy of organic SEO, and then the short-term strategy of paid advertising and then balancing them. But you need the long-term strategy uh, for everything to work because, I mean, you drive these people to your website, they come organically. Uh, you can then remarket, retarget those people. And that's where the money really comes in, I think. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And once they visit your site, are you also trying to get them into like a, an email funnel? Like what, what's the, what's the typically next goal once they land on the site, read the article, what, where do you want to see them go next? The customer? Yeah. So some of the articles, uh, which talk specifically about products, uh, we call them product guide articles. Uh, they do recommend a product at the bottom. Um, and that was actually, we didn't always used to do that. Uh, that was actually a recommendation from our customers who were reading the article and said, oh, but where's the product you guys are recommending? Yeah. We thought, oh, that's a bit odd. I guess we better uh, we better recommend a product at the bottom. Yeah, um, great feedback. Yeah, so that, that, was, uh, that was really interesting. But generally, we, we try and get the, them into the email funnel. Uh, we have our, the pop-up on our website. Um, there are a couple of different funnels uh, on our site, one of them being the subscriptions uh, funnel as well which is its own self-contained one. Uh, and we try and drive some people to that too, because I mean, it's a really good deal. You get 20% off uh, and it's no obligation. You can cancel at any time. You could basically just order and, and cancel within the month and you know, it would be fine as well. So we try and drive people to that as much as we can, because I think that's a, that's a great deal for everybody. Um, otherwise that's, that's all there is because once they land on that, uh, once they land on that page, if they're logged into Facebook, we will get uh, them into our Facebook funnel. Uh, so they'll, we'll go, okay, this person landed on this page. They viewed this blog post. We can now remarket to them with uh, other interesting information, or we can remarket to them with a product or just something more generally about the brand. I see. So you're not just retargeting with them with like a, a product that sometimes you're sending more than more content. How do you decide which one you want to send, what kind of ad you want to display to them? It really depends on how they've interacted with the website. Um, so we have a lot of different segments and audiences set up on, uh, on Facebook, uh, which allow us to target, you know, someone who viewed an article about probiotics um, or, and often those are quite, Audiences. Um, so I, you know, I put a word of caution out there with that because you don't want to totally overwhelm those audiences. Um, and it's often better, I might be jumping around a bit here, uh, but it's often better to take an audience like that and then create a lookalike uh, of it on Facebook and then remarket to them as well. Now you, the, the subscription funnel that you mentioned, this is to, to get them into a, this, a subscription program where they pay monthly and they get a, a product or get products. 
Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And you mentioned that it's a different funnel than your your other email funnel. How, how, how does the subscription funnel work? What does it look like? Basically, what we wanted to do was simplify the subscription process uh, because, I mean, you can go to any of our product pages and purchase a product and choose to purchase it as a subscription. Or you can basically go to the subscription funnel, which is more like a, a builder order form uh, style. So I think uh, Shopify had a lot of good documentation on how to build an order form uh, in in Liquid and, uh, and JavaScript and with Ajax. And so basically that's how this was built is like, okay, you go to the subscription page, you sign up for an account, uh, you tell us how you came to find um, out about the subscriptions. And then at that point, you choose which products you want to add to your subscription. So basically what we're trying to do is capture people, bring them into the funnel, um, get their email before they purchase uh, with the incentive that if they give us their email uh, then and accept marketing, then we will show them this order form for purchasing subscriptions in an easy way. And that's been really, really successful for us. Like I, I think we've seen between 30 or 40% of all people who have landed on that page end up purchasing at some stage. Wow. So I think what I'm looking at right now on, on your site is that I'm going through a, a product page and then when I click add to cart, it gives me, or buy now, it gives me a pop-up that asks if I want to buy this one off or save 20% with the subscription. So once I add it to cart here, then I'm automatically enrolled in the subscri subscription. That's a different kind of flow than the one that you're talking about where there's a form that they fill out where they get a, a, a discount code or something. Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, so they, they won't get a discount code. Um, actually, if you're on the site, you can navigate to the subscriptions page, uh, which is available in the in the navigation bar. And that sort of runs you through the process. Um, so, the, yeah, the reason we came up with this uh, is because we wanted to test out what it would be like for people to build their subscriptions this way, rather than have to go to the individual product pages uh, and add them one by one. So it's more for people who are already already know about the products. Uh, they already know about. They've done a lot. They've done their research. They're ready to purchase, uh, but they're looking, you know, for that extra incentive. Mm, got it. Now, a subscription program brings on a whole new slew of sometimes challenges because you now have a, a customer that that is obviously paying every month, which is great. But then you also have to make sure you're fulfilling every month. Do you guys have a, any tools or applications that you're using to help manage this? I mean, the, the tool we use for all the subscriptions on our site is Recharge. Uh, so it's a, I think it's a very well-known, uh, well-loved uh, app on the mm -hmm. Shopify app store. Um, it's been, been really great. The support team there is really second to none. Um, and yeah, I, that's been uh, really good for us because it helps us to really see all of our customers, uh, be able to manage all the interactions with them. Uh, we've, I guess we've customized the styling on it uh, quite significantly in terms of the back end as well to make it really, really easy for people to come in, pause their subscription, cancel their subscription. Mm -hmm. Any tips on how you how to get the most out of the the recharge app? Or are there any specific changes that you've made uh, to to uh, to get more value out of the the, the application? Uh, certainly, I think. Uh, really working and spending some time customizing the back end, the customer portal side of things where customers can manage it. Because, I mean, as a lot of subscription companies will know, when you have a, a, a subscriber and they get their charge and they weren't expecting it, that can create a lot of uh, customer mm -hmm. service issues. Um, so you need a really, really on point customer service team, first of all. Um, but it also means really making the user experience really good. So like you need to make sure that they can go in onto the website easily and be and pause or cancel their subscription. Like don't try and hide that. Uh, I think that's one of the one of the things we learned early on. We didn't do it intentionally, uh, but a lot of uh, subscription companies will make will mean will make it so you have to email them to cancel the subscription. Just let the user do what mm -hmm. they uh, what they want to do. <laughs> right, give them that kind of self service uh, empowerment so that they can do it themselves, and that will yeah. let them both feel like they're not you know kind of getting scammed because they can't they can't cancel themselves, but then also reduces the strain on, on customer service if that's all they really need is just to hit a button. 
and they can do that themselves. Um, now, I think one of the, the biggest uh, uh, or the, the most focused on uh, uh, factor with the subscription services is that churn rate. How do I keep a customer around month after month? Any tips there? Like, what, what have you guys been able to do to, to try to uh, reduce the churn rate to keep customers around and paying every month? Yeah, um, I mean, disclaimer with our products as well is that they are supplements. So people do, Mm -hmm. once they start taking them, generally need them um, and they'll want to repurchase. So part of what you can do is build, uh, I guess, the retention strategy into the product. Um, And that's been what's great about uh, working in the nutritional supplements industry, because something like probiotics, people find their work, they'll want to keep taking them. Mm -hmm. Um, The next thing I would say is provide content to them that's interesting and related to their purchase. Always keep those touch points up with the customer. Remind them that you're there, that you're real people, um, that you really want to just have a conversation with them. And if they want to pause or cancel, that's fine. There's no problem. You want to take that stress out for them, um, I think. And then, yeah, I guess it's really just about going above and beyond for customer service. Like mm. just do everything you can to, to make sure that the customer is getting what they want. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think that's really it. The customer focus. Yeah. I think you, you do mention that too in our, in our pre-interview where you mentioned that one of the, the keys to success is to make sure you answer all of the questions your customers have carefully and considerately across all platforms, whether that be Facebook, live chat, email, and phone. How do you mm. control for this kind of quality across the, the team and through each experience? Because again, you do have a team and there are so many different platforms that, that customers are reaching out to you on. How do you make sure that the quality is high there, that they're getting the customer service that, that you want? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess it goes back and this is something we've been learning, uh, I guess, on the fly, but something I, I also take from my experience working for a uh, Swiss banking software company, which is process. You need really, really good process documents in place. Uh, and you need to make sure that everyone who's involved in the execution of those processes has, has buy-in to, to building them. Um, so we do have some really good documentation in place uh, that we've set up with our customer service team. Uh, which has been contributed to by, in fact, I think all members of the of the Aura team to make sure that we have the right messaging. Um, our customer service team is also, they also compile all the questions that uh, people ask. They compile the answers. Uh, then we put those questions up on our website and we see those questions sort of drop away. Um, yeah, I would really say it's about making sure you codify what is working and what isn't. And that goes for, you know, whether you're doing Facebook marketing or anything like that, as much as it does for how you deal with your customers. Uh, I like that approach of taking the uh, customer service uh, interactions, the questions they're asking in and putting them as frequently asked questions somewhere on the sites, because why not keep this live document going where people can reference it for themselves? Again, going back to this idea of letting the customer do what they what they essentially do to work in and help them figure it out themselves. And you are talking about these other documents that, that, that you're creating other than the, the list of questions and answers. What kind of documentation do you create for your, for your team? So kind of like we do for the uh, for our riders, we do the same thing for our customer service agents. So we provide them with examples of how uh, each of the the answers to the questions that customers are having are again authoritative, helpful, and interesting. Um, we really analyze those and pull them out for them so they can see the kind of writing they should be coming back with. We also review that with them. Uh, I think on a biweekly basis. You guys don't say Fortnite. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it's it's very much the same approach. Got it. Uh, is there a software that, that your team uses for customer service? Uh, we use the Facebook Live Chat uh, application. I think they actually only released it as a beta a couple of months ago, actually. Mm-hmm. And then for email, we use Zendesk. Got it. Yeah, I did notice the, the pop-up on the bottom right-hand side of the site, that the live chat. What kind of questions do customers typically ask through here? Oh, all sorts. Um, they'll ask like whether the vitamin, whether the protein powder has stevia in it, for example, or uh, where what ingredients make up the vitamin D. 
Um, and a lot of that information is on the site, uh, of course, but sometimes it's just easier. People just want to chat. It's just easier mm-hmm. to, to talk to, to talk to someone. Um, and that's something we're working through as well in terms of customer service is that we want to build all of the content that's on our site into including all of the blog articles into a messenger bot. Um, because I think, I mean, everything's going that sort of conversational e-commerce route uh, at the moment and will continue to. So it's important to be able to make it, make these sort of flows or funnels for customers within uh, the conversations that they're having with you. Mm. And when they are reaching out to your reps through live chat, are they typically converting through there too? Like what's the, what, what happens once their questions are answered typically? Yeah, the the conversion rate through uh, questions, product related questions is really high. Uh, it's something, again, yeah, I think in our pre-interview uh, uh, chat, it's, uh, it's something we want to proactively increase. Uh, we want to actually reach out to customers while they're on the website. So see people who are spending more than two minutes on a page and, you know, have an agent reach out to them and say, hey, are you enjoying the page? Is there anything I can help you with? Mm-hmm. Um, are there any questions I can answer? Because the conversion rate through that uh, becomes much, much higher once you start talking to the customer. Yeah, I like that. It's similar to what the experience you get if you go into a retail store where you're walking around and you might have a question, but no one's approaching you yet. But why not make that that the same kind of experience available online, especially since it's exactly you, yeah. can, you can reach out to so many more people this way. Uh, I think um, one of the concerns that entrepreneurs have when they're first building out either a, or bringing on maybe the, uh, their first customer service rep is how to handle questions that might not be, uh, that they might not have given their rep the answer to. So what, what happens in those cases? What do you tell your customer service reps if there's a question that a customer asks and you, they don't have the answer to right off the bat? Yeah, um, so that that happens a lot. Uh, because our customers have a lot of different questions, mm-hmm. so I'm very familiar with that with that issue. Uh, we ask our reps to just basically delay while we find out more information. Um, we always give them 24 hours, so they will then reach out to uh, our product team uh, or uh, our management team, depending on the question. The way that we actually manage that is they'll either send an email out to us or mm-hmm. they'll put it in a, we have a Slack channel, which is specifically for customer questions. Um, so that'll go in there. They'll tag the the correct person who should be answering the question. And then once they've got that down, they'll record it uh, and put it in the frequently asked questions document. Mm-hmm. And any tips just in general on hiring customer service representatives? Uh, my main tip <laughs> is to find people who have empathy. Uh, and that can be quite hard to quantify. Um, it's really just about finding people who are able to see from the perspective of both the customer and from the company perspective. So from management, high level perspective, because you don't want people who are just going to, I guess, immediately panic when there's a tough question mm-hmm. and then just try to get out of the situation rather than talking to the manager to try and figure out how they can answer this customer's question or, you know, I mean, we've had, we've had quite a, a few scenarios where we've had an angry customer because the shipment hasn't been delivered by USPS. Um, and our customer service reps are, I mean, they're great. So they always reach out to us. They say, okay, we have this angry customer. Like, I understand why they're so angry because I would be too um, if USPS had lost this for seven days. Um, and we usually come up with a solution to it uh, all together because, I mean, the customer comes first. Everything everything comes uh, after that. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned empathy too in the pre-interview and you mentioned that it's not just the, the customer service representative that needs to have empathy for the customers and, and, and the, the management. But then you also mentioned that it's important to have empathy for your employees. And I think this is interesting that, that you bring this up because I think one, one I guess, cynical way to think about it is, you know, why does an entrepreneur, why does a founder need empathy for their employees? You know, they're already paying them. What, what, what else do you need to do here? What's your response in that case? Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's tough because you, if, if you're going to have a happy employee, happy employees, I should say, <clears throat> Let me start that again. If you're going to have happy employees, you've got to really focus on uh, what 
motivates them. Um, because in the end, a happy, motivated employee is going to do a much better job than one who isn't. And the best way to do that is to you know, really understand the situation, understand their perspective, um, and show them that you understand their perspective because they'll respect you a lot more uh, if you do that. I think if you neglect uh, neglect that aspect of it and just expect the work to be done, then sure, the work will probably get done, uh, but it won't get done as well as it could, and the employee probably won't enjoy doing it. And in the end, you want everyone to enjoy working at your at your company, I think. Right, that makes sense. And any thoughts on how you can either train yourself or help train your staff on getting better at empathy or empathizing or getting better at understanding the other's perspective, whether that be the customers or you know, fellow employees? Yeah, um, I think one of the most important things we've done is we do a lot of information sharing between each of the different functional teams. So product will come and talk about their issues and their problems with the rest of the team. Uh, so will customer service. Uh, sometimes we'll talk about problems we've had with Facebook ads um, and we'll all just sort of relate to each other and ask each other for advice. Uh, regardless of you know what position you are in the organization, uh, everyone's allowed to have their input. Um, and it just really, it, I think what it does is it teaches everyone how, first of all, to give constructive criticism uh, because you don't want to go and annoy someone um, who is your manager uh, and you don't want to go and annoy the customer service person because then they might be unhappy the rest of the day and then make the customers unhappy. You st- you really start to think about like all of the ways that the, the interactions happen within the organization. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about the, the site itself, um, the, the website. One interesting thing that I found about the site is with uh, the, the top level domain name. So it's not like a typical .com or anything like that. It's a .organic. So O-R-A or a .organic. First of all, I didn't know that that, that domain, uh, top level <laughs> domain exists. So uh, I'm learning something new every day. Now, how, what, what, is this, what implications does this have on things like SEO or discoverability of your website? Uh, honestly, it's been it's been great for for SEO because we there was no way we could have gotten aura.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we we could have gotten aura.co, but the organic domain name is really appealing because to get it, you have to have all organic products. Like you have to be mm-hmm. a, a certified organic company. Um, so that was really appealing to us. Uh, we're also called Aura Organic, so that was also very convenient. Um, and then. In terms of SEO, I mean, after after we aired on uh, on ABC's Shark Tank, we were actually ranking number one for just the search term Aura, O R A, mm-hmm. the three letters. So I don't think it's detrimental to the search term at all. And I think if you can find a top level domain that isn't necessarily a .com but really truly reflects the nature of your company, then it's worth it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So speaking of Shark Tank, you, one thing that you mentioned was that because there were so many people that were watching a TV show like Shark Tank, you're getting a lots of traffic to your site, but not all of it was qualified, right? There are people that are just maybe curious, uh, but they would never buy a product like, like yours and just come and check it out. How do you deal with those situations where you just have a lot of traffic and maybe you have your Facebook pixel on there, or maybe you have a, a lead capture form on there and there's a ton of people that would never actually be your, your customer. How do you deal with that situation? Yeah, it was uh, it was really interesting. I think uh, during the Shark Tank airing and after it, eighty five percent of our traffic was mobile. Uh, so it was clearly a lot of people who were coming and just flicking through the website on mm-hmm. their phones. Uh, so the way that we decided the best way to capture that information would was to have a competition. Uh, we set up a competition link uh, on the website, and we used that to capture emails and uh, for marketing purposes as well, and. Yeah, I think our conversion rate from that competition link was 14%. Uh, so it was it was really like quite fantastic. We just realized that, oh, okay, if people are watching Shark Tank and then maybe they're not so sure about the product yet, then the best way to get them on board is to offer them something uh, where they can win something. And that was, yeah, that was really, really effective for us. Were you changing up the, what kind of questions were you asking them in the, the giveaway sign up? Were there ways for you to 
qualify if they were potential customers or not through the giveaway sign up? They weren't actually. Uh, so it was, we just tried to make it uh, as low friction as possible. All mm-hmm. you had to do was enter your email and accept marketing. Uh, and then that was it. We did have obviously the Facebook pixel running uh, and we had kiss metrics running as well. So we uh, were tracking where people were going on the site, what they were clicking on. Um, and then we obviously get some demographic information from Facebook, but it was more what we tried to do after we'd capture the emails was segment people based on their response to the newsletters uh, that we sent out. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we were already doing that. Uh, but what we do is we say, okay, these people clicked uh, on this particular uh, newsletter that was very heavy in content on Omega-3. Like these people were interested in Omega-3. Um, and we kept that list separate, the ones that we gained over that Shark Tank period from our standard newsletter list um, until such time as we could reintegrate it with more information. Got it. Because uh, some some folks might care about omega-3s, but might not care about protein powder, and you don't want to have too much noise in their inbox. You want to focus them on the specific product they're interested in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Got it. And you mentioned Kissmetrics. Is that your analytics tool of choice these days? It's not anymore. Um, we've actually just uh, gone back to using Google Analytics because uh, that is, I mean, it's an extremely powerful tool. Mm-hmm. Um, we also use uh, a platform called grow.com, which allows us to sort of connect everything from all our sales channels, including Shopify, together. And uh, I'm a big proponent of that platform. It's very, very customizable. Um, we keep a lot of our sales data and inventory data in SQL databases. Uh, and grow.com can access that and, manip- and manipulate the views of that data as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm a big, big fan of that. And then, of course, we use the Shopify reports, um, okay. which, I mean, they have gotten so much better over the last six months. Mm-hmm. Um, like my first port of call usually now when I want to know something about the last week is to go to that dashboard and just view that. Uh, so, yeah. Nice. And is grow.com, is that, um, is that, would you recommend that for, for beginner stores too? Or is that something that makes more sense when you have a lot of traffic and sales? I think it makes a, a more sense when you've got a lot of traffic and sales. Uh, it's, it's on the expensive side, like mm-hmm. I think around $800 a month. Um, so it's definitely once you've got lots of disparate sales channels and information and analytics that you need to pull together. It's also, I, I would say unless you're a programmer or you know something about um, a fair bit about SQL, mm-hmm. then yeah, you you sort of need that experience as well. Got it. Now with Google Analytics, which is completely free and accessible to to anyone that that's just starting, are there any recommendations there on what kind of reports or what kind of metrics uh, a, a newer store might want to pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, if you're just starting out, like the one that sort of uh, I've always relied on is the source medium um, report, which uh, under under acquisition, it's just a really quick way of seeing where traffic to your site is coming from. Um, and if you spend some a good amount of time setting up your UTM campaign uh, parameters within Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest and all that, if you do that correctly, then it can be a really like really good tool for figuring out where your traffic is coming from. Um, otherwise, I would say probably the the top conversion paths tool is also really good uh, under conversions. Um, that's a, a really good way to sort of see how people are bouncing around mm-hmm. through different channels before they purchase. So they might go come through Google AdWords and then come back direct and then come back through organic search and then come back through Facebook and purchase. Um, and the top conversion paths report will show you that. So that's really helpful too. Yeah, well, that 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 definitely is an interesting data uh, data point to know. We do see that kind of flow where they're coming through organic search and then leaving and coming through Facebook later. How do you how do you make that data actionable? What what can what kind of steps can you you take knowing the the path that a customer takes? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really good question. Uh, it. It's really down to, I think, how you set up the campaigns. I think it's a little more confusing if you just stick to what's happening organically. Um, But if you're running a bunch of uh, paid campaigns, then it can be really helpful to see what, how people interact with your campaigns and then how long it takes them to come back. So basically how long the information you provide to them sticks around in their mind. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then how long it takes to bring them back. So it's more of a qualitative measure um, of how people are perceiving uh, the content you're providing. Right, that makes sense. And based on, you mentioned that during the, the Shark Tank airing, 85% of the traffic came from mobile. Is to, these days, are is there still mostly mobile traffic or what's what's the split right now for, for the traffic that comes to your side between mobile and desktop? Yeah, it's still about 70, 30 in favor of mobile. And that, that includes mm -hmm. tablets as well. Um, so we, we see around 15% of our traffic come from tablets now. Uh, and yeah, I guess around 60 from, from mobile phones. So it's been, it's really, it's really quite high. Uh, and because of that, we have spent a lot of time optimizing our website to be mobile first. Mm -hmm. Any tips there on how you can, can do that to make your website uh, more friendly for, for the uh, mobile traffic? I think, uh, my main tip would be that your mobile website doesn't have to look exactly like your desktop website. Mm -hmm. Um, is that ideally things should move around as you get into a smaller screen. Um, but where things don't make sense on mobile because they're too big or too unwieldy on desktop, um, you should just remove them, just hide them on mobile. Like don't be afraid to hide or move content around to make mm -hmm. the experience better for the consumer. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's a good, great point because the attention span is shorter on, on mobile. There's less tolerance for digging through information, digging through noise that that you should approach it differently and not just think about how can I cram all this desktop content into a mobile screen, but be more selective about what you actually want to include in there uh, versus not. Um, other than uh, than for mobile or uh, for mobile or for desktop, any changes that you guys have made to to the site that have had uh, an, a large impact on conversions lately? Yeah, probably the biggest change we did. Uh, sorry, the biggest impact change we did was actually quite small. We put a picture of ourselves of our team on the on the homepage, uh, just over on the left hand side, and we make that the primary primary picture you see when you land on the website on mobile as well. Uh, since we did that, like we A-B tested that first. Uh, so we introduced the picture and then we removed it and the conversion rate increased by around about double just by having that picture uh, of us on the homepage. I, th I think for so long, uh, everyone, like all of us, all of the team don't generally like to, to be in the, in the spotlight <laughs> that much. Um, so with, with our about page, didn't even have pictures of us. We were sort of an unknown quantity. Um, and as soon as we put that up, I think people started to really see that, oh yeah, these are real people behind this company. Right. Um, and a lot more, found it a lot more relatable. Yeah. I definitely noticed that when I came to the site that it's very, I guess, human centric uh, approach to, to design and not just throwing products in the customer's face, but show them that they're actual real humans behind this company. That that's uh, definitely uh, an important um, attribute to, to put out there. So, you know, thank you so much for your time, Sebastian. So Aura Organic is the, the store, is the website, is O-R-A dot organic. Very cool domain. Uh, what, are you, what are you and the team uh, focused on for, for this year? What are some big goals that you guys have? Uh, so our big, big goal uh, this year is to really ramp up the customer service uh, side of things, to really take that proactive um, rather than reactive and build out stuff like uh, the messenger bot uh, and things like that. Uh, we're also moving a bit into the retail space. Um, we have a, a pretty big deal lined up. I can't say who yet, um, but uh, that should that should increase our touch points with the customers. Um, yeah, that's really... That's, those are really the two big things, I think. Awesome. Sounds like a great year to come ahead then. Thank you so much again for your time, Sebastian. Great. Thank you. Here's a sneak peek for what's in store in the next Shopify Masters episode. When we are coming up with the kit, it's, it's to keep it as almost as general as possible, to target as wide of an audience as possible. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial. Also, for this episode's show notes, head over to shopify.com slash blog.